friends. Uh, my name is Lindsay Wyrick, also known as the Frugal Crafter, and you are listening to the Frugal Crafter blog blogcast. With me today, I have Sarah Burns from Sarah Burns Studio. She is a wonderfully talented landscape painter, artist, and uh, just all around awesome person who agreed to be my guinea pig for my first interview on my podcast. How are you doing today, Sarah? Hi, thank you. Wow, what a nice intro. <laughs> I'm doing really well. I've been looking forward to this because I watch all of your all of your YouTube videos. I really enjoy your sat chats. I always have those on in the background while I'm working. So this is kind of the same vibe. Like we're just chatting about stuff we love. So yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> Oh, my pleasure. This is, uh, I'm so excited to pick your brain because I watch your videos too. And what I really love is you're not afraid to just jump in with something new. Um, one day you're doing gouache, the next day you're doing watercolor. Then I see you out plein air painting with markers. And meanwhile, <laughs> I feel like a, I went to the Inktober retreat and I brought like this set of like 300 markers with me. I'm like, <laughs> this would have been more fun with like five markers and just wandering oh, around. But it's like, I... <laughs> Yeah, no, I think it's almost like a curse, though, because I can't do the same thing all the time. I have to be doing something different all the time. And uh, I just I envy the people who can pick one thing and really focus on it and hone in on their craft. And, you know, it's always the grass is always greener, right? Like they have their own struggles and want to achieve certain things. But I just do think it would be nice to focus on one thing for like a whole year, but I could never do it. I just, I've, I've art ADD, if you want to call it that. I just have to be doing something different all the time to stay happy. I totally understand that. And I think that, um, when you get stuck on one project or in one media, if you get, just switch gears and grab something else, when you're working with that new product, a lot of times that problem you're having with the other painting or the other uh, media, something clicks and it's like, oh, I didn't think about doing this. And then you can run back to the first one and and uh, yeah. get yourself out of whatever oh, so stumbling true. block. Yeah, I've experienced so that So what would you say? Is... Well. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, it's always tricky to like not talk over each other or finish the sentence and yeah I, I get it <laughs> yes especially since we're so far away you're in scotland and i'm in um in maine usa so there's probably some digital yeah. slight lag. delay but not hopefully hopefully it will come across well in the audio podcast <laughs> Let's hope this is first time, guys. Just be be yeah. gentle with us. So, what what product or what supply do you think you come back to more often than the others? I would definitely say watercolor um, because it's just so. I get I get into a very free mindset when I use watercolor, even though I still do with drawing and ink and and gouache and everything. Watercolor just is inherently you can use it so spontaneously and fluidly. And I'm really drawn to that. I've always loved abstract art. So in a way, like I like making pieces of the painting almost abstract. And it's really fun to do that with, with watercolor. And I like being surprised by my mediums. And it kind of helps me follow that cur that vein of curiosity when I'm painting. Um, so yeah, I would say watercolor is something I fall back on constantly. And I do the the most, especially in my free time. I maybe don't make videos about it all the time. I I really enjoy making um, uh, drawing or ink or gouache videos because I'm trying to get better at those things and explore those things. So I find it's just a fun way to explore it when you're sharing it with someone. Uh, but yeah, in my own free time, when I'm not talking to anyone or recording anything, watercolor is my go-to thing. And I always keep a little sketchbook and painting kit uh, on the couch with me <laughs> and my husband and I will be watching some show or something and I'm just sitting there painting and sketching and making a giant mess. <laughs> oh, same here. I've got little hidey holes all over the house where I stash art <laughs> yeah. supplies, little mini desks here and there and, and uh, random drawers where I tuck stuff because I don't know, I, I guess I like to be busy or I have an idea, but I don't want to be holed up in my studio down here in the yeah. basement. I want to be, you know, yeah. with other people and yeah. Cozy Actually, lately, or this winter especially, I've embraced painting in bed. <laughs> I never used to oh. do that, but now I we I just get like all the duvets and just cozy up with a cup of coffee and just get my, usually it's like a portable painter, so something easy and less likely to spill <laughs> uh, or just <laughs> ink or something. I don't know, something not, definitely not gouache. Gouache is my probably my messiest medium, so I avoid doing that. <laughs> Uh, on the couch or in bed, but it is just a very relaxing pastime. 
That's really interesting. And I would love to hear the setup of the in-bed painting because I know several of our viewers have physical limitations or maybe they're on bed rest for a pregnancy or they just can't uh, get up and be mobile around running into a studio, setting up yeah. a large workspace. And that's a space they have. So can you explain your layout for yeah. when you're like sitting in bed and painting? Mm, I totally get that. I, one of the main reasons I started doing it is because I hurt my back a while ago and it was just, I only, I just needed to lay down for a few hours. And I was like, I'm, I'm not the kind of person who can just lay there and do nothing. So I'm going to sketch, I'm going to paint. Um, what I usually do is get really big pillows and prop myself up. So I'm kind of sitting upright and I just like bring my knees up and balance my sketchbook on my knees. Um, or I also do have one of those like foldable table, um, it's like a serving table almost that you can put over your legs and mm -hmm. it's not too high or anything, but it's just a big flat surface, a stable surface. So you, I could put like my little palette on that if I want to, but most of the time I'm just using, um, I don't know where it is, but my portable painter because it's so easy and stable. Uh, I don't have to worry about it tipping over as often and I can just kind of like nestle it into the blankets or on that little tray table thing. And I just use, uh, Sometimes I'll just use a water brush with a tiny, my micro, portable painter micro, which is really easy to, it's just, you know, flat on the bottom. So it typically doesn't spill. Uh, and a water brush is very portable, very easy. Um, and I typically keep my sketches smaller. So I'm not doing like big finished studio pieces or anything like that. Just a little sketchbook, a little kit, a little setup. And I'll put my iPad next to me if, if I'm using reference photos or having music or something on. So it's oh, a very a relaxed setup, I would say. <laughs> Nothing. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. It's almost similar to my painting, my setup outside a lot of times, actually. Like, yeah, just small. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Do you, do you get out much this time of year to do plein air painting? I, yeah. Well, I, today I went to the coast for about two or three hours to sketch. Um, I'm actually working on a video, which, so if, I don't know when this will air, but you might see it. <laughs> By the time you hear this, uh, I'm, I got some new pens that I wanted to test out. Um, so I try to go out at least once a week, even though it is freezing. But some weeks it is just so stormy and rainy, like raining nonstop. I'm not going to go out in that. Uh, but this today go, was the first time in maybe like seven, six, seven days that I got to go out. But it's always very That's... short sessions. <laughs> like <laughs> go out, pick a spot. 15 minutes move to a different spot because if I don't move I get way colder uh, so I try to kind of keep that going and it actually it's really great for encouraging you to not get too precious with something um, you know pick a small doable subject or part of a scene and practice your hand-eye coordination drawing it maybe is a good option for this time of year because you're not lugging around a ton of equipment and at least here in Scotland, it's so humid that it takes forever to dry when it's colder. So I oh. typically avoid wet, really wet medium if I can. You know, if I'm using watercolor, it's a very light wash at the most, like one layer. <laughs> and watercolor pencils are pretty good for that. You can use that with a water brush. Um, but today it was just ink. It was just drawing. So it was oh. very relaxing. And it was just this cute little coastal town painting little views that I could see and it was wonderful because it was finally sunny <laughs> rare oh nice was it ink like a micro pen it is called a pilot parallel pen I'd have never okay. heard of it before it's probably it's been around forever but I just started seeing it on a couple urban sketcher posts that I was um that I saw and I was like I'm gonna give it a try because it has a really wide metal nib. It, it's like a flat, wide metal nib. It's so different to anything I've ever used. I use a lot of different fountain pens. And this one, the one thing I struggle with with pens or fountain pens is that I can never get a wide wide enough uh, line or I fill in a thick enough area with dark ink like as fast as I want to. But this was like a game changer. So I can't wait to share the results. Um, if if this is a video, this is what I painted or drew today. I don't know if anyone would be able to see this. Oh yeah, but that just, looks awesome. I yeah, love that really, bold, that contrast. Yeah, this this is the actual thickness of the line. Oh wow! Yeah, so it is that very, one. That's um, one looks like a night scene. Even is one a night scene uh, with a really one? strong shadow? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that one, it's actually a bridge. 
so this is a shadow on the shadow side of the bridge. Um, oh, but I filled wow. it in kind of a lot. <laughs> but that's that I'm was like, it. you know, a minute of filling in with the pen. It was it took no time at all. So if you can't see this, I'm sorry. <laughs> but basically what I'm showing is <laughs> a drawing with, you know, there's areas that are just pure ink. And it was, you know, a few seconds. It wasn't like I had to get a brush out or do anything special. It was just this pen. And I it's it's the coolest pen. I think it's my new favorite. Um, oh, that's awesome. Sorry if I got to off topic up. there. <laughs> oh, no, not at all. I think that's that's great talking about what you're excited about. Is that going to be a video on your channel soon? Or yeah, hopefully this film? weekend if I can edit it tonight and tomorrow. Um, I love editing late at night. It's like another thing I'll do in bed sometimes or on the couch. I just have my little laptop and put my headphones on and get lost. It's like as relaxing as reading to me, which maybe sounds weird, but wow. I really enjoy finding the the nice music and putting all the clips together in like a creative way. It's like, it's, it's its own art form to me. Um, but I don't, it's, it's just uh, in the comfort of my comfy chair and on my laptop, you know, I'm not moving a bunch of materials around or anything. It's just a different art form for me. Uh, so yeah, hopefully really I'll have that out I really see that sooner. in your work. <laughs> I, <laughs> sorry, good. guys, if I'm t topping over her words, it's um, it's the, the lag a bit. But I see that when I look at your your videos, they're more like films. They're so cinematic, and you have the drone footage, and it's like, I, and I'm I'm watching it like she set a tripod up and she walked in front of it. I'm like, like look at her go. She is like so <laughs> yeah. so cinematic. Like you're really thinking yeah. about what do you, how are you going to make this at, look like somebody is with you, and that's what it feels mm -hmm. like when I watch your videos. It feels like I'm standing right next to you while we're painting. Yeah on location and i mean the yeah. time and effort put into that to make to bring somebody in and make them feel like they're a part of this experience is it's it's yeah. way above my pay grade i oh. i'm just like overhead <laughs> shot <laughs> no i that is also really nice i like doing that studio one camera face down on the on the desk oh so nice um but yeah, I guess it, I think it just comes from my background as a photographer and slowly got into cinematography. I used to do wedding photography and all sorts of other things, but photography wow. was my only like creative outlet for a really long time. And when I realized I could kind of marry that with my my uh, painting and, and drawing obsession, I would call it, I thought that would be a really fun, like I said, it's its own art form to make videos like that. And I'm obsessed with techno uh, I would say cameras and drone photography and drone s cinematography is new to me but I'm I love finding ways to creatively use that in the videos and give kind of like a holistic experience someone coming to the coast with me and seeing what it's like mm. and I actually learn a lot from seeing my drone footage and seeing that different perspective I I, I yeah just kind of teaches me something different about the landscape and about how light works in the landscape and yeah, yeah it's it's so fun and it is exhausting <laughs> but it is so um, worth it looks it, it. oh well, it's yeah. so beautiful to watch it's like wow I that's one of those things where I I think um I think a new youtuber could almost be intimidated by seeing like Wow, this oh, is a film not. I'm watching on oh not not in a not oh, in a um not in a bad way but more in like a it's like wow, we can. I can. I could get to that level. Maybe I could do something like that too. It's just. It's not. Oh, I've had a lot of bad videos before now. Trust me, like, I've been doing videos since. Not uh, it. I don't know. 2017, more seriously. 2018, 19, but like a lot since then. And it's there's so many cringy bad videos out there. <laughs> Older videos. We all have them. But I turn... always say your first 200 are, are awful. <laughs> My I first know, 200 okay. are awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you learn so much every single time you do it, not just about video editing or, or making the video like it's about camera setup and what cameras you actually like to use and what you can use to get this angle. And it's a guessing game <laughs> most of the time. But each time you're like, well, you get one little tip that you're going to use next time and make it better. And it just kind of snowballs. So just like with yeah. art, I mean, the more you more skills you learn, more technical skills you learn, you can kind of like push it farther the next time. And yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, definitely uh, do you have any tips for people that want to go out and plein air paint in the winter, especially, but any time mm. of year? Uh, well, besides what I said earlier about like kind of painting small and 
moving a little bit more uh, mm-hmm. and not using as much water, it's, I think, p- picking a good location is key. Like here, we all have a lot of Arctic wind and it's just, if you're in the wind, you're freezing okay. no matter what. So if you can find shelter somewhere, pick a view with something interesting that you're still kind of like protected by trees or a building or something that helps. Uh, or I actually do car painting a lot or car drawing, whatever. I sit in the car, either I drive or mm-hmm. we're on the way to something and I'm like, oh, pull over. I have to paint this. And we take 15 minutes and just do that. Man, my husband's so like patient and <laughs> kind for letting me do that. But he also knows it's like part of my business. So um, he he's like, OK, he'll just listen to music while I do that. Uh, but I guess no matter what time of year, I always kind of approach it from the same mindset of I want to be in the place and experience it. I don't just go out to make a thing like I want to be there and feel the sun or get lulled into a peaceful mindset by the waves. You know, there, there's so many things to experience and drawing is sort of secondary. If I, a lot of times I go out uh, with my stuff, but I don't always end up making anything because it's just like I want to sit mm-hmm. in this beautiful place and observe it and just be there. Um, so don't put so much pressure on yourself. I think that's I've done that before and I never create anything I like when I when I do that. Um, if you have the option to go back to the place, it really helps because you can go once or twice and just experience it and then go back and paint it or draw it. That is tricky, That's though, when you're traveling, idea. obviously. Um, like when I first moved to Scotland, I, I was almost approaching it like I was going somewhere and not knowing if I'll ever go back again. So I was like, I have to paint it no matter what. And it was like a pressure. And I still mm-hmm. tried to enjoy it and, and make the most of that time and make something good as well. But it was over time I realized oh okay I live here now I can go back to these places more than once and it's interesting to see how my sketches and paintings have evolved since the first time I've been to that location uh I see think I see different subjects but I also have different skills now so I can paint it differently um sorry getting off topic there <laughs> oh, that's uh, but yeah, I, know. No, I love just hearing the process Oh, yeah. Just I honestly going out with a mindset of I want to be in the place and experience it rather than paint something perfect or do it, create something that, you know, I'm going to sell or send to a gallery. It just gives I think you that's that so freedom. important because, yes, yes. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> Um, I think that's really important because a lot of times the uh, the plein air pieces that I do, I feel like they have so much energy and immediacy and mm-hmm. there's a lot of truth to them. Like there's a lot of, there's accuracy, but there's not like the rendering or the, the finished detail or the, you know, the stuff you do that, make, that makes the work pretty, the highlights, the, mm-hmm. you know, fleshing stuff out. But it has such, it almost has like a little bit more of a power to it because you were there, you were experiencing it. You probably, you know, I probably project that on my work that I do out and about but there's nothing like getting out there Mm -hmm. in the in the um the the sounds and the wind and actually last weekend um we've had these really crazy storms in maine we've had a lot of like flooding and rain this winter and so i'm like i bet there's all kinds of sea glass and weird stuff up on the Mm -hmm. beach so um my husband and i were out the coast last weekend i'm like let's go to the beach it was so cold i was so unprepared i'm like how does sarah (laughs) do this it's so cold oh my gosh (laughs) really warm clothes really warm layers for sure and like fast <laughs> get a sketch in get a painting in and move <laughs> um oh well that's yeah. that's great advice i definitely was not was not prepared and there was all these cars and i'm like where are these people it is so cold they must have been on oh. the trails maybe bundled up but i was uh, like thing uh, you i'm not do, for this you could get a little mini hot water bottle and like you know if you're torso tends to freeze or you know whatever area you need it you can just like cozy with that um or even sit on it if it helps like i i have these uh foldable they're like foam but they're they're called thermal camping seats or camping pads and you just fold Uh them up and they're waterproof and sort of thermal so Uh no matter where i'm sitting i'll have that with me and it kind of helps a little bit so i'm not soaking the coldness up from the earth um, yeah. And I've never painted outside or maybe only once in, in like below freezing. And a lot of people say you can use like uh, vodka or something to add that into your water so that your paint doesn't freeze uh, while you paint. But mm-hmm. I'm not that extreme. <laughs> it, it, I just wouldn't enjoy it. I think I would just be like yeah. shivering too much. I already have a shaky hand, so that wouldn't help. 
Oh, I tried some winter plein air painting. It was at the beginning of the pandemic. And I remember this clearly because I just got my taxes done. So it was like March or so. And I'm like, I'm going to go to the Audubon. We go on the trails. I had, uh, you know, the Himmy gouache that's like that brick. It's kind of like the old Himmy set of 24. And, you know, had that in my backpack. I'm like, this is so heavy and I'm cold. And I'm like, and I did a sketch and it was, it was awful. It was just like, you couldn't even tell it's, you know, when you're in the woods and there's like not enough contrast between anything to really make out what you're doing. So everything just looks like chaos. Oh, Oh, it was just (laughs) chaos. And I was trying to get dark shadows with purple and it was just like, it was, and I was just uncomfortable and cold. And I'm like, it's a humbling experience for for sure. (laughs) Yes. Humbling. That is exactly, exactly it. I like to say that I'm always humbled (laughs) when I go Mm -hmm. out and paint. Oh, I mean, oh, occasionally sure. I do something I enjoy, but most of the time it's like, oh, okay, that was a good learning experience. We'll just close that sketchbook and set it over there and not look at it for a while. <laughs> like, yeah, it's, that's why I think if you enjoy, uh, focus on being there and, and enjoying the experience, no matter what happens in your sketchbook, you'll still come out of it with an enjoyable memory. You know, at least there's a better chance of it. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Something I really love that I see you do often is work on toned paper and then also do little like vignettes on the toned paper. Mm. And there's something about that combination of seeing all of those little, those little like snapshots together on mm. a page. It's so satisfying. Yeah. And it's almost like I love doing the, that. the sum, the sum of all of them are better than any individual yeah. one. Yeah. It's, yeah. And uh, you can use any, any one of those little to like go back to the studio and paint it larger Um, because usually you also take photos while you're there. So you have like your little sketch, your memory of being there painting that little spot and your photos. So yeah, I find that much more useful actually than just sitting down and painting like an A4 size scene. Actually, I don't think I, maybe I've done that a few times, but it's really rare if I paint larger than like A5 outside. Um, but I really prefer to paint smaller little snippets of what I see when I took Ian Stewart's workshop, he called them postcards, which I thought was perfect. Mm -hmm. It's like painting a little scene, a little postcard, even if it's in a, in a bigger sketchbook. Um, yeah. And then you can just use that back at home if you want to, or, or just have the memory. I love looking at sketchbooks just as much as a photo album. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. That's what it reminds me of, kind of like an art journal or a photo album. Yeah. I, and I, I'm obsessed with following, um, like the only, the only people I follow on Instagram are other artists and yeah. <laughs> a lot of them don't even speak English or from other countries. And I, I love seeing their little sketch, their sketchbook journals mm-hmm. that have like, um, words and has pictures and it's got things pasted in. And it's just like, yeah. you just saw like that a, is... like a collage of their day yeah. or their week. And I, it's yeah. just so fascinating. So i tried to get better at doing that like adding pretty titles and words and I it's always an afterthought I think you kind of have to go into it with the idea of how you're going to lay out this spread that really helps <laughs> but I, I follow mm-hmm. some people that do that really well and I'm just like wow can you imagine just sitting there looking through their sketchbook of their travels and it, it would be like better than a photo album <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Because you're seeing it through an artist's eyes. And I think that's what yeah. we do. Because if yes. you um, paid yeah. attention to architectural details on a building, and I mm-hmm. love it, seeing tensions Same. for the year. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah it's just that's so why cool I went out to today see. to do that. It's like, it, yeah, it's, I want to go somewhere really cool, some big city and not be intimidated. <laughs> because when mm-hmm. you go to a big city, and there's a lot of things to choose from, you're just like, whoa, where do I even start? <laughs> Yeah, it it must be so um so neat to be in Europe because of so much it, the everything is so much older. All of like the buildings yeah. are older, and everything is kind of crammed up together. And uh, it's it's just sort of it's a very be... different aesthetic for sure. And yeah. it's funny because if you live here long enough, we actually we were talking about this in the car earlier. Like, if you live here anywhere long enough, things become normal. So, when I first moved to Scotland, my husband actually asked me, "Could you?" do you wish you could rewind and like see Scotland for the first time again? And I do because of that feeling of like awe and even a field full of sheep was like the most beautiful, spectacular thing. And now it's so normal that I can drive by it almost without noticing. Although I do because they're so cute and Mm -hmm. yeah, you just, it's so hard to go back to that fresh perspective of, uh, 
now when I see all these old buildings, I'm like, it's so normal. If I saw a wooden house, I would be like, whoa, what is that? Like, it, <laughs> that's so normal in America. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it is. It's uh, it's interesting being here. It's I think each country in Europe has kind of their own aesthetic, their own vibe, and probably depends on what type of building materials they need to use for their climate. But here it's definitely stone, lots of stone. <laughs> Uh, and you do see like log t cabin or timber houses occasionally, but that, you know, it's like new, like it's kind of a popular new thing here in the highlands, but mostly it's all stone and it's so beautiful. Uh, and yeah. yeah, it just has that old world feel to it. I wonder if it's because there were a lot of like just natural stone available or if like yeah, the, uh, the natural wood buildings just timber. rot in the humidity. Yeah. yeah, I think all of that, like way less timber, the, the human climate, everything is just stone will probably stand the test of time much more. And there's a lot of it. And it's interesting because like Aberdeen is a big city near us that it's known as like the granite city, the gray city, because they have yeah. so many granite mines and gray rock over there. They use that to build the city. Um, but other towns have kind of a different feeling, like more reddish stone. Uh, I think Glasgow is one of them that has a lot of red stone. Um, but yeah, it's. I think it has to do with the the environment where they get their building supplies. If we can mine our own stone, it's a lot cheaper than importing something. Oh yeah. And so yeah. Wonderful. Uh, well, something else I want to talk uh, to you about, because there is a little treasure on the internet that a lot of people don't know about, and it is your blog, The Fearless Brush. <laughs> I was poking mm. around in there, and honestly, anytime I have a question about gouache, and I'm doing a painting, and I ask my people, and I say, geez, I'm wondering about this. Has anyone tried this brand of gouache, or has anybody tried this? Or I wonder how light fast this really is. You know, mm. maybe I'm feeling like the 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 ratings on it tube of paint might not be quite accurate and your name comes up every single time i think sarah has a chart on that i think that she's got that in her database she's got a video more. on that and, and it's like no. and sure enough it's if i need to know about gouache i go to your uh to youtube but what more importantly your blog because you have such an extensive gouache database could you mm. talk about that a little bit the obsession you mean <laughs> sure I, yeah it all started when Back in the day, what now is getting into gouache now. It was just, I can't not approach something from an analytical mindset for some reason. So when I try a new material, I'm like, what is it capable of? Like the the manufacturer will tell you all sorts of things about it. But as you paint, you start to get to know it. And then, you know, if light fastness matters to you, you, I, yes, you can trust some sources online, but I was sick of guessing or like reading something that contradicted something else. I was like, okay, I'm just going to figure this out on my own, do as many life as tests. And, you know, I tested some mold things with some of the gouaches as well um, and put all the results on there. It's like totally free if anyone else is curious. And I do wish I had more gouache. It's just, I can't get a hold of all the gouaches in the world here. Uh, but at some point, I do want to keep trying like more like Turner gouache is one I get requests for all the time. So hopefully I'll get th some of that soon. Um, and continue to update it. Uh, der... <laughs> yeah. Sorry. And... No, it's okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was just, it became an obsession. And I think I did the majority of the gouache comparison test. Like I would open a set of gouache and do a full swatching review and a full painting review and everything in one set setting or two days maybe. And then I would go to the next one and the next one and the next one. It was like weeks at a time, just couldn't do anything else. And I compiled it all into one spot. So you can see all the results to make it as easy as possible. Um, and it's purely because I couldn't find what I wanted online all in one place. And I do find a lot of value in looking at lots of different sources because everyone's going to approach something differently. And like Jane Blundell, I look at her blog posts a lot about um, watercolors, especially Daniel Smith, because that's she's a brand ambassador. Um, but she's going to use them differently than like this artist will. And I think each experience is going to be is going to offer its own value. Uh, so that's just the gouache database is my experience as a landscape painter. And all of my demos are like landscapes. So, you know, it's pretty specific. If you're a illustrator, an illustrator who does kind of more of a flat style, you might have a totally different opinion about how a gouache performs because you will use it very differently than I do, um, which is completely valid. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. 
Uh, but I did also start including the life as tests, as I said, and most of the results are up by now. I think six or eight months up in the window. <laughs> I took a bunch of them down because I couldn't see out my window anymore. And now I think the only ones up are that I'm currently testing are Shinhan and one of one or two other small sets I have. So within like four months, I'm those will be ready to see. Uh, oh, I can't wait yeah. because I have a set of 12, the Shinhan, because I love the, the the kind of bright rainbow colors in the set of mm. 12. And I wanted to test it out without without spending a ton of money. And we didn't yeah. have a like local store selling it. And it was kind of like, I love the paint so much, but I was looking at some of the pigments in there. I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I trust yeah. the light fastness ratings. And so yeah. I'm like, I don't typically do the light fast test because I don't feel like I am knowledgeable enough to know how long to leave them out. But I'm like, right. okay, if I want to paint with this paint, I really want it to be in the rotation, but I want to know if I'm going to hang it on the wall in my main far from the equator house that it's not going to fade so i just i made a big swatch and i and i taped um black cardstock ovals to the center of each swatch and i stuck them in a windowsill and i would just actually checked on them the other day and one of the one color that i didn't expect would fade most of the colors were fine but one that it was using a pv 15 ultramarine violet i'm like that shouldn't okay. fade that's the only one that that's faded surprising. and i was like yeah, that's really surprising. Yeah. So I'm wondering no, if there was an why error it's so on good the. To do your own, if uh, if you have the window space and the time, it's really yeah. helpful. The other thing I learned is um, a lot of fading happens when it's diluted or tinted with white. So mm -hmm. all my swatches, all my my light fast tests include the tinted versions as well. Uh, maybe some of the brands I'll never use again. I didn't do, go into that much effort, <laughs> but I I try to do that for most of them just to get like a fair assessment of it. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'll put the, the Shinhan results up as soon as those are ready, but I don't think I'm going to hang mine up in the window for longer than like six to eight months, uh, because if it hasn't faded by then or even shown any signs of fading, it's usually fine. And I learned mm -hmm. that from the all famous handprint website, mm -hmm. you know, that everyone refers ah. to, um, yeah. he goes like, really <laughs> in depth about doing light fast tests. Uh, and maybe if you live like near the equator and you're, crazy hot sun all the time it's going to be different there i live in the north of scotland so yeah it's it's going to be different here but it's at least something to start with so mm -hmm. you can like you know see if anything has, ch has changed at all and go from there but i do recommend people do their own just if if that matters and if you are selling originals just to know <laughs> and most of my stuff is not for sale so i don't have a huge concern with it. It was more out of curiosity mm -hmm. that I started doing all this. And I like making spreadsheets and I like, you know, finding out as much as I can about what I'm using, even if I don't need to know it. So yeah, I think that's, that's kind great. of where the it database came benefits. from and where the blog posts or the blog itself is more, it was a kind of a way to separate my personal art website from all of the learning content I do, teaching mm -hmm. content. So yeah, it was like, if you're like me, you want to be fearless when you paint and you just want to go for it, not be so scared, you know, make mistakes or that's kind of where all that the fearless brush idea started from. And I started sharing all of my anything that's like a tip or, you know, how to or tutorial, anything in that vein, I, I post there. And then my own art website is like my portfolio and my shop. So it's definitely a totally different world. <laughs> And, and my fearless brush blog, it's the page itself is, is a variety of mediums. It's not just gouache, but I do have the gouache database because I didn't like, there's already tons of watercolor database out there mm -hmm. that are really, really good. So, you know, I didn't <laughs> feel the need to do that, but, um, maybe there's other gouache databases as well. If someone wants to leave a comment and let us know, that would be awesome to hear. Um, but it, it's more of a newer medium, it seems, especially for, for artists, uh, maybe not for illustrators, but I, I just want to learn as much as I can about it, especially with the materials I use frequently. So, Oh, absolutely. Um, and that just helps everybody. So yeah. it's so appreciated. And I will put a link to your blog and the database tab specifically mm -hmm. so people can find that in the, okay. um, in yeah. the show notes and the YouTube comments. Yeah. Um, I actually have no a ad. question. <laughs> so it's, not it's so like wonderful. It's so anything. pretty to look at. <laughs> it's so pretty to look at. I mean, it's like it's like looking at, 
I used to love magazines and there aren't many art magazines anymore. And looking through your blog is like flipping through uh, my favorite art magazine. Oh. So I oh, highly so recommend nice. it. <laughs> yeah. When you're working in your sketchbook with your gouache, do you ever find that um, when the pages will rub together and you'll get shiny spots, especially on like watercolor paper? Yeah, occasionally, especially if I keep them stacked on top of each other because the pressure, I think, like, mm -hmm. you know, pushes the pages together and you get that, like, micro rubbing that happens and it's almost yeah. like bur burnishing, is that what it's called, mm -hmm. where you, like, get, yeah. you can, you can do that with gouache. Um, sometimes I'll seal the page with uh, cold wax medium. I, th I have Dorland's mm -hmm. brand, there's probably other brands, yep. but that's really nice because it also protects it from water in case you, like, spill water and it gets on your sketchbook. I've done that and ruined the sketchbook before. So I try to remember at the end of when I'm done with the sketchbook to just like seal things. Or I also sometimes put tracing paper between the pages uh, and like even just regular paper, you can just like sandwich it between. And hopefully that helps a little bit so they don't rub on each other. If they're still going to rub, mm -hmm. it's, it's more a matter of how you care for your sketchbook, how you handle it, like keep it vertical on the shelf or... Mm -hmm maybe don't toss it in your bag as roughly as, as you are. <laughs> uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, it happens. And I think that's just how it is in a sketchbook. Cause it's not on its own. It's, it's always with other pages. It's hard to isolate it in that sense. So um, I don't, it doesn't bother me because usually what I do is after I paint, I take a photo and I scan it. So it's, mm -hmm. I have a digital record when it was perfect or, you know, non messed up with the other pages and then it's good to go for if I need prints or just to share it online and then if it happens to get scratched or something in the future oh well <laughs> if you were sealing a page and it was like two gouache uh, paintings back to back would you seal both of them or just do one page and it would be I would do both would to protect them both but then I would put a piece of uh tracing paper between them or you know oh, you slick still vellum that. or something like that yeah yeah a lot of my okay. older uh the sketchbooks that are focused on gouache have a lot of, they're like thick because they have a lot of pages, <laughs> uh, pieces of paper between the, the pages. Uh, you could, or wait, am I thinking, I'm thinking glassine paper maybe. So it's like mm -hmm. um, waterproof paper. It doesn't mm -hmm. absorb really anything. So um, yeah, anything like that would work, I think, to protect them from each other. Uh, I but used to use deli paper really helps a lot. Sure. Yeah. Sorry, what? Oh, good. Oh, I will use uh, deli paper a lot for that because oh, yeah. like many years ago I ordered, I thought I ordered one box of a thousand sheets from Sam's Club and they sent me like um, a thousand boxes. I think it was like, <laughs> yes, seven boxes of a thousand oh sheets. God. So I had like all of these, like, and so I had one of those um old pH tester pens back from scrapbooking days. And so I'm like, well, let me see. And it was acid free. So I'm like, well, I guess this is going to be my art tracing paper slash glassine slash yeah. <laughs> sketchbook protector because I've got a lifetime supply of this. And I don't think I'll make that many sandwiches in my life to wrap up with the deli paper. Yeah. So I use that. <laughs> That's a good point a though. Acid free. Whenever you're you, whenever you can, always choose acid-free papers and products because it, just the longevity, it, it makes a difference mm -hmm. in that. So it's something, yeah, yeah it's, I, I don't know where I heard it, but I heard it early on, thankfully. So it, I always kind of had it in the back of my mind, but it, maybe it isn't known to everyone. So it is good to mention once in a while. Right. And yeah, most art products are labeled as acid free yeah. and, um, and most of your art media will be acid free where you kind of, I think can find trouble is if you're collaging in um, like ticket stubs or, you mm -hmm. know, shopping bags or things like that. But as long as, as long as you're comfortable with the risk, you could also coat those products with matte medium. So you have a acid buffer before you stick them in your sketchbook. If you're really concerned with that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Tape adhesives tend to be also problematic. Like the um, yeah, I've uh, cello that. tape, especially. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I think we all have. Um, all right. Well, my goodness, this has been such a fun chat. I, know, I feel like we could um, talk what... for so long. <laughs> like there's so oh, many things. I know. We could have a I whole know. different what podcast supplies? about all these topics. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I know I could talk about our supplies for <laughs> forever yeah. or plein air painting or so many yeah. topics. Um, what supplies are you really excited about right now? You mentioned that the, the parallel pen, is there anything else? Well, ink in general, I've been like at all 
whenever I do my sketching at night or off camera, whatever you want to say, I am leaning much more towards ink lately. And now that I found the parallel pen, that's my newest obsession. Um, but dried gouache, like in a portable painter or any kind of small palette like that is my new, that's the only way I want to use gouache outside, which is oh, wow, not problematic or anything, but it's like, I've made so many videos about using gouache with wet palettes and like all these different materials, palettes, using it in different ways. And now this is like the only way I want to use it. And I never thought I would say that. So I have made one or two videos about using it that way. And I hope that people can see that, you know, it's my new favorite thing, <laughs> new favorite uh -huh. way to use it. Uh, but I get st almost daily questions about like, oh, what was this palette that you recommend? And it's like from four years ago. And I'm like, oh, no, yeah. I don't recommend that one at all anymore. <laughs> uh, so that's always Things tricky. Have and I know, <laughs> I'm sure you know exactly what I, how I feel <laughs> yeah. when you talk about art supplies all the time. Oh, but, yeah. But yeah, yeah dried gouache uh... is just my new thing. And if I'm painting with gouache outside, it's definitely with, with dried gouache. And, and specifically in my portable painter, just because it's so, mm -hmm. so easy. Are you using water brushes for the dried gouache or are you using the water uh, no. buckets from the classic take, portable painter? I take out my little tiny, it has a lid. It's like a water dish with a lid. And I also pour water into the side part of the portable painter, which is like the the, the, the cover, you know, when you take it apart and set yep. it up. Yep, the little um, legs. And then, I yeah. Take, yeah. and then I take my own brushes out because I way prefer regular brushes when I'm using gouache. Mm. I just... I, I don't think I would enjoy it at all with a water brush. You have to control water so much with gouache to get the results mm -hmm. you want that I think a water brush, like I would seriously struggle with that. Um, yeah, and it's easy enough. I just have a, a, a zipper pouch thing for my brushes that keeps them flat and straight and like protects them in my bag. So I'm not mm -hmm. worried about them breaking or anything. So it's, yeah, that part's easy. Um, or I use my Etcher Slate Mini, which is like the self-contained art bag and it like unfolds to be its own desktop type thing that's mm -hmm. if I have a little extra energy you know it all really relates to what energy level I am that day how much yeah, effort absolutely. I want to make <laughs> I love like, the dry gouache idea I, I tried to take out uh, well, a couple of times I've gone out with, with wet gouache and it always seems like I make such a mess I had the little mm -hmm. the tiny little palette that a lot of people had that had the yep. like pop out cup that yep. fit in the bottom oh, of that little strap actually. to carry it. Yeah. It's... I I don't know if I filled it too much or it was just such a mess. <laughs> and then I was using water brushes, but I also had the bucket, but the water brushes were getting so clogged. Oh, no, and yeah. it was it was just and I didn't have enough space to mix on the lid from that little that little palette. And then yeah, I had seen a video struggle. of the John Mio Yeah. And um and then I was like, well, I wish it was more like watercolor because it's so much more contained. And I had seen, I think this was before I saw your video on, on dried gouache, but John Muir Laws had posted that he took like a Cotman sketcher box and he mm. filled it with gouache. But as it was drying, he pressed his finger into the gouache to compress it so it wouldn't crack. And yep. I thought that's a great yeah. idea. And I did the same thing. And that that little tip helped probably because yeah. I was using some pretty cheap gouache. So it really wanted to crack. No, that so I'm just make doing it, that. That does make a difference. Yeah, it, and I think even watercolor helps with that um so it doesn't shrink as much in a mm -hmm. in a pan or something like that i've seen that um but the mixing tray space is tricky with those little palettes for sure uh i think that's actually what taught me how to or maybe led me to the way i paint now which is to always mix on the same spot even when i'm in the studio and i have a huge mixing tray i always mix in the same area I guess because I have had to do that outside for so many years. Um, but mm -hmm. I do have this six by eight inch size mixing tray. It's by Gorilla Painter. And this is like, I use mm -hmm. this in and out outside and in my studio, um, but it has a lid. So you can put mm -hmm. your gouache in it. And when you're oh, done, nice. cover it and it lasts for days. So you can still use it. It's not going to dry out instantly. And you know, there's all sorts of different wet palettes you can use in the studio, different sizes that are really convenient. Um, or you can, you know, paint on a tray or even a plate and then cover it with cling film for a couple days. And yeah. usually it's okay. So there's different tricks to that. Um, but outside, I got sick of, I, you know, that little palette you were talking about, the square um, with the pop-up lid and everything. I yeah. dropped one of those full of fresh gouache <laughs> in two no. separate occasions. I dropped it in sand. And there's no recovering. <laughs> it's 
So yeah. after the second time, I was so upset and just done. <laughs> so I'm a mm -hmm. little traumatized with those at the moment, which is a huge reason I was like, let's just go for this dried gouache thing. And it is working out mm -hmm. amazing. Like, it just suits my style of painting. Like, it just... It suits my setup, everything. It's working really well. So, yeah, I'm just going to go with that for now. And uh, hopefully eventually it catches on that. I'm not using those four-year-old palettes I was back then. And Yeah. <laughs> Do you bring a tube of white with you? I use I use a tube of white and I also do squeeze a little bit in the palette but it's always contaminated with other colors so you know when it when white if it needs to be like fresh or bright white I always have a little tube just in case and that mm -hmm. is such a, I go through that color that tube a lot you know white is probably one of the most used colors um so I would at least have one pan full of white just in case I forgot the white tube and refill it frequently um but yeah it's mm -hmm. It's always in the... I think I have one in every single bag I own. I have a brush, a water brush, just in case, um, a white tube of gouache, and probably one or two other things I'm not thinking of. But I try to... I have a bunch of different backpacks I'll go out with for different things and try to be ready at all times. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things yeah, I love about another tip, the... Though, with um, plein air is if you can have a yeah. go bag, like, ready to go mm -hmm. at all times. So maybe you buy duplicates of your yeah. favorite, favorite, favorite art supplies have one set in your bag or your car so that there's no excuse or no like talking yourself out of it. That was, that was a game changer for me for sure. Oh, absolutely. And I, I had got this, have you ever used those Viviva color sheets? The, I like, know, the but I've seen them. Color? Yeah. I know what they are. Yeah. I have, those are so handy this for, cause you can keep it and like they have these little binders that are about the size mm -hmm. of like a day planner and a little pocket that has your colors mm -hmm. in there and a sketchbook and a, and it comes with like a water brush and a pen and mm -hmm. they're not my favorite watercolors, but the fact that I can have that and sit on the couch or I have one in my, the back of my car and I have a small, very small car, especially in the summer, cause I want to be top down convertible all summer long. So I have that tucked, <laughs> you know, under the seat and yeah. I can pull over and I can use that. It's, yeah, it's not my favorite palette, not my favorite watercolors, not my favorite sketchbook, not my favorite brush, not my favorite pen, but it's yeah. convenient and it's there and it just, it gets the job done Yeah, exactly. Um, because it makes and it not precious. Exactly. And then, you know, because if you don't bring something, it's when you see something you have, you were like, oh, I really desperately want to paint that and I don't have anything to, to do it with. I've been there too many mm -hmm. times. So now I just always have something ready, usually in the car or at least by the door. That yeah. really helps. And it's a delicate balance. If you bring too much stuff, then you'll be overwhelmed and won't get anything oh, done. But if you don't if you don't have anything, you can't do anything unless maybe you can scrounge yeah. up a an old receipt yeah. and a ballpoint pen or something in your car that you can sketch on really quickly. I know. And that kind of goes back to what I started saying at the beginning was how I wish I had just could focus on if I I wish I loved just ink and watercolor in a sketchbook. You know, I had my two or three favorite items that I only ever wanted to use forever how simple life would be but instead I have like 20 different kits and 20 different setups and favorite versions of different materials and it's a mess always oh I I hear you this year because I've I get very tempted by the oh what's that new shiny thing new shiny thing new yeah. shiny thing and part of it is because I review a lot of products on YouTube yeah uh, so it's it's fun to try these different things but this this year I definitely want to revisit a lot of my favorites I was just using pan pastel and Derwent light fast pencils yesterday and it's like oh I've like I'm home you know it just feels yeah. so good oh, to get back so to those nice favorites yeah, rediscovering those mm -hmm. things. Because if you do set those aside to do other new things, to try them out, you know, that's fine too. But when you go back to it, it's like such a sense of being in the right place at the right time. Like you just, it was meant to be. <laughs> it suits you so mm -hmm. well. And yeah, yeah, I get that for sure. I think that, that goes for me, it's watercolor. Yeah, I think I think and constant switching gears also can, um, you know, you kind of have to always have to run to kind of catch up and, and get back in the groove with every time mm. you switch. So, um, yeah. yeah, I think I think probably one of the best devices for beginners is to like start with a limited palette, get to know what you have, see how versatile it is, and then add then add something to it that will make it more versatile. But I think yeah. the the trend is to get the biggest set right away. And then um, <laughs> I think tempting. you can get overwhelmed and it can actually slow you down from learning oh, sure. because yeah. instead of like having six colors to mix from, you've got 48 colors and yeah. um, 
And, you know, then it could be either you're just picking the color you need and wondering why is why does it feel so discordant? Why is nothing? Yes, exactly. Why the color harmony. Clash? Yeah, yeah. I totally. But get it's that. fun to have that 48 set. You know, I, I you know I can just look <laughs> at my my if I look in my Amazon affiliate links information because um, I use Amazon affiliate links if I'm recommending something if they sell yeah. it or blick or whatever but i can see what people on amazon i can see what people are buying and it's always those bigger sets people want to yeah. you know they want all the versatility and all the all of the options and i i get that you know if i get the chance if i'm going to review something i'll buy the bigger set if, mm -hmm. I, if unless it's crazy expensive because i want to see how the whole range is but it can yeah. almost handicap you a bit because you're not really getting to know those baseline colors and you're mm -hmm. getting distracted by all the new and shiny yep. and i'm oh so guilty of it <laughs> i get it the that was a game changer for me when i started using a limited color palette um and this is a little thing i'll just mention the plein air podcast the plein air magazine all of that whole franchise whatever mm -hmm. the plein air podcast is one of the most amazing resources for landscape artists especially and they basically interview like master artists all over the world and they all talk about what their favorite materials are and what what their advice is to, it's to beginners and seasoned artists and like after you hear a hundred of them <laughs> you get the the underlying message that you know start with limited palette for sure and keep things simple at first because like you're saying it's so tense you can do so much and a lot of masters over time have proved you can you can do even more with a limited set like that color harmony is inherent when you start with the same like five colors and use that for the whole thing mm -hmm. so yeah it's that was a game changer for me and definitely i don't even i don't get tempted anymore because i know if i'll just you know, buy a set of 50, but I'll use the same five colors every time. And I'll just, the others one will sit, the others will sit on the yeah. shelf. So. Oh yeah. I, <laughs> I wish I could learn my lesson a little more often. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> but yeah. yeah. And you so the player podcast then... is. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No, it's just, yeah. The, the message does sink yeah. in over time. Like you just, you have to go through it in your own way and discover it in your own way. But if since you're reaching a lot of people, it is good to, to mention, like, start with less and then grow. After you know what you like to do and after you've painted for a while with something, you know what you're missing or you get a sense of something that, oh, OK, that actually would make my life better or life easier. And then you can seek it out. Maybe wait for sales. <laughs> You seem right. to be really good at that. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. There's, um, there's a, a uh, I don't know what you call it. It's called, a, it's it's not a real syndrome, but it's called full, full set syndrome that, oh. you know, you want to buy every single color in the set. That's something <laughs> that I, I see a lot. People saying, you know, my full set syndrome is, is a complete and, or I suffer from full set syndrome. And I think because all of these colors are made, manufacturers will make, a hundred colors or more people think that well i should probably buy a hundred colors but they don't necessarily real realize there's that variety because every artist has a different base mm -hmm. color they want they're they're nobody's using a hundred colors in a painting or even has that many colors on their palette they're uh they want to have that variety so people can get exactly what they want some people will yeah. like a brown that's a little more red or one that's a little bit more green or one that's a little bit um more black and some people just want single pigment colors some people don't care if yeah. the color is light fast or not they want the vibrant colors because they're going to reproduce it and everyone has their own different criteria but yeah. i think it can be very um very enticing to see all the colors and think well i'm going to collect them all like um baseball yeah. cards and the manufacturers have no problem people collecting them all they oh, for sure. they're they fully in support of that <laughs> yeah. but it's important to just I, I feel like have some sort of um a sanity baseline saying, you know, you don't have to do that. Your work's not going to be better by buying all those colors. It may even be worse. It might take you longer to learn because of that. Yeah. And I did want to recommend, I did want to mention that the Plain Air podcast is on YouTube. I think it's, yeah, I, is it Eric it is. Rhodes is the host Eric of Rhodes. that? Mm -hmm. Eric Rhodes. Yeah. And it's on podcast yeah. app. So if you're into yeah. Plain Air and want to check that out, um, that's a great, is a great resource. Oh, I love Absolutely. it. Yeah. Uh, especially if you have, uh, if you like, well, they don't just do landscapes. They, most of them are landscape painters, but a lot of them also do portraits and things like that. So, mm. uh, Can you tell me what exciting projects you have coming up or any oh, exciting products that you want to tell everyone about? Uh, well, I... You have all kinds. 
<laughs> so many things. Mostly, I'm, well, I am trying to keep up with my weekly YouTube videos. That's a little bit of a struggle this time of year, uh, but that's always going. And then I don't really make many like products or any la have launches or anything. I don't sell a lot of originals, but I do sell a set of brushes that I collaborated with Craftamo. Um, that's always available on the Craftamo site. There's a limited edition of gouache subscription box going out, but that orders for that are closed, which, you know, so I won't talk about it too oh, much, shoot. but that's going to be exciting. Um, we might open orders up again in the spring, but, you know, they'll get gouache every month in the mail with a tutorial. So I've been really busy oh, making fun. all the tutorials. Uh, I have to do like the whole year for that. So, um, but yeah, the brushes, I mean, that's what you see me using in all my videos. That's like the main product I would say I do besides little prints and things on my, my own shop. Um, but project wise, I kind of go with the flow. Like I don't like to plan too far in advance with my videos. I often, I didn't know what I was doing for this weekend's video till today, till I went to the coast to make <laughs> that video. So that's pretty common. Um, occasionally I plan like a week ahead, but, uh, since I don't like have a specific thing I do on my channel, like one thing, it's kind of more free flow and, a lot of my videos anyway are about just the experience. So I want to, you know, take people out. I can't go out if, if it's just pouring rain or, or having storm after storm after storm. So yeah, that's kind of why I kept, I, I never made promises on my channel. I just said, there will hopefully be a video this week. <laughs> and then that's what I kind of build everything around. Um, and I have my Patreon in the background that's always going. So I do two tutorials for that each month, um, which again is more if you're interested in learning how to paint rather than just mm -hmm. watching it happen and being there in, in the moment with me. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that all of that together keeps me pretty busy. <laughs> so. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, I would love to do another so workshop this year, but we'll see. It's still early. To, to yeah. Tell. Well, where would people find out about that if they did want to keep in touch? Do you have a newsletter or I do. Uh, I have a like newsletter. That people can sign up for. I try to do a monthly newsletter. Uh, so my website, there's a sign up form for that. Um, and yeah, it's also just kind of behind the scenes stuff and maybe updates on upcoming projects or if there are events, I always mention that. Um, but I would myself like to take a workshop uh, this year as well, like go somewhere nice and. <laughs> I did a Ian Stewart workshop last year and it was the coolest experience. And I know you teach workshops. I would maybe love to do that someday if I could afford it. But I come down to France yeah. in May. I know it sounds amazing. Um, It'll be yeah. warm. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. oh, I hope so. I know. Well, you have a lot I would going love to go on. Do you have any right now? Oh, <laughs> seriously, yeah, it is. It is cold here too. Um, do you have any tips for anybody looking to get into art or art as a business or anything like that? Um, I mean, I would say if you're comfortable, try YouTube. <laughs> Maybe I'm biased, but honestly, mm -hmm. if it is something you're trying to make into a business someday or even like a side hustle, whatever you want to call it, um, getting putting your authentic self out there is much easier to do in a video format. I find even if you're not on camera, like even if it's just top down, maybe your voice, or maybe you're just putting text on screen to explain what's happening or yeah, like that kind of long form content in, in a world that's so full of just insanely fast, like scroll, scroll, scroll videos popping out at you and screaming at you. Like uh, I find it's much there's a much deeper connection on my YouTube channel than anywhere else. And I think it has to do with that long form, slower, relaxed mm -hmm. drip content. Like it's just easier to get to know someone that way. And I guess because I'm on camera, it also helps me express myself easier than if it's just posting a photo or something like that. Um, so, you know, maybe t dip your toes in that if you're interested in getting into that. Um, did you ask about people who are just getting into art or business i kind of took that in the business uh, yeah <laughs> that's what i was kind of thinking of well i mean i intended to ask you that earlier but then i was like oh i've totally forgot to ask that <laughs> just oh, like, yeah, my first interview here so i <laughs> oh, mean no, being interviewed not not 
not being the, the person asking the I questions. I heard what I'm, I wanted I'm to kind hear. Of a train I wreck. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's great. Um, no, because I know a lot of people that watch the channel are thinking about um, they might like to uh, maybe do an art fair or sell oh, some yeah. of their products or start yeah. a social media page to uh, I've talked to many friends that are like, oh, I wish I just had the nerve to start a blog or mm -hmm. to start an Instagram account, but I'm afraid that I'm going to do it wrong. And I'm like, mm -hmm. just do it. You're, you're, everyone's a hot mess when they start out. And then yeah. eventually you find your, your look and your style and what you want to yeah. say, but you know, you, nobody's coming out of the gate looking great. Everyone's coming yeah. out of the gate. Like one kind thing of, that, you know, fledgling. Thing that can help with that, I think is to take pressure off the act of posting it. Like, one strategy I've heard a lot is people make five or 10 pieces of art or posts before they ever share anything. So when they post that mm -hmm. first one, then they know, okay, I can post another one in three days or once a week or whatever. So it's not like, okay, I did it. Oh gosh. Okay. Now what? Like I have to do another one. And you know, um, it kind of gives you that buffer <laughs> to just slowly try it out or, you know, just remember that not any one post or video or anything is going to like break, make or break you. Like going viral is not the strategy you want. That is not the way to have a sustainable following. It's going to bring followers of the wrong kind, if you know what I mean. Like you mm -hmm. want people to find out who you are and enjoy watching your regular content, not just that one viral video and keep mm -hmm. coming back because that's you know, not to get too technical, but the algorithm will reward you more if pe if pe if your actual followers are returning, not just suddenly a huge influx of followers. Um, so mm -hmm. never try to go viral. That's like my strategy. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, of course you want, if it is your business, you want views and you want things to do well, but the viral side of it is like not where you want to be. It's not going to lead to the sustainable business in the long run. Um, so hopefully that takes some of the pressure off as well. And, and also know that every single person who comments on your well, for the most part, they're real people, and they're mm -hmm. actually interested, and you can have a dialogue with them either in the comments or in DMs or something. Or you'll see like repeat comments. And those are the that's like, you know, your tribe, that's the people who will keep coming yeah. back. And it's fun to chat with them in the comments. Uh, so definitely embrace, I'd say embrace that side of it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, I used to think like, oh, if I post this and it doesn't do well, or, oh, if this one thing is going to make or break my, it's going to represent me forever. You know, the whole picture comes together. If you keep posting, people get to mm -hmm. see, you know, how you evolve as an artist. And I think that helps them connect more with you because yeah, we're not just all sitting around making perfect art and posting. <laughs> like if you share the yeah. in-between moments, that's also relatable more relatable i guess sharing yeah, sketches even. Some of the like i off. love sketches yeah. when i i think i like sketches more than finished artwork a lot of the time so i, I try to share that as well and it seems to be you know the follow the following responds well to those things um so it doesn't always have to be the perfect finished piece that you're hanging up on the wall <laughs> life moments yeah, and as well. I, we're, we're putting way more importance on that post than anybody else that's scrolling by. And, you know, somebody might just kind of, yeah. kind of fly by it. And we're yeah. thinking, you know, our, our reputations is, is riding on this yeah. post, but um, I know. yeah, take a, take a step back. It's, you know, people can come back and find it. Don't, don't put that much pressure on yourself. It's, yeah, exactly. it's, uh, it's not true. Pre it's not true. It's, it's hard to um, kind of step back and be objective about yeah. your stuff and you know and... you might post something and then realize oh i made a huge mistake on that and it's already out there <laughs> and nobody else is going to notice you know yeah it's it's so i don't know if this happens to you but i am terrible at predicting the things that will be successful or like the most enjoyed i yeah am, i guess the opposite one like i put something out i was like this is the thing that's gonna be the best you know people are gonna love it and then the it's like eh, it gets an okay response and then i post like oh i'm tired today i'll just post this random drawing it gets like you know 500 more likes than usual <laughs> just like i don't get it i don't get it so what you yeah. think is gonna be the best is not always the case mm -hmm. i don't it's just um i don't know <laughs> don't know how to explain that yeah. phenomenon i think just do whatever you're excited about and yeah. you know that's, that's... Some of it will will stick, some of it won't. But as long as you're happy with it and you're and you're keeping yourself excited, then hopefully you'll avoid the the burnout. You see so many creators quitting either mostly on YouTube. You hear a lot of people to 
you yeah. hear about a lot of people quitting. And um, I think it's it's that trying to please other people constantly. And then if you're not getting the results that you were getting in the past and you're putting out that same amount of effort, it's, it gets very disparaging. But if you can yeah. just kind of try to, and I'm horrible at this, but if you can try to forget about the numbers and the algorithm and the views mm -hmm. and just uh, create stuff that you're excited about, then... Yeah. Um, I mean, there's always more and more people posting. There's always more and more videos, more and more content every yeah. minute and trends come and go and change. But chasing that trend, chasing that algorithm, trying to be Must something be that you don't even want to be. Yeah, yeah. you're just going to be miserable. And, you yeah. know, I need to remind myself and of that. Often. It's the concept of a thousand true fans. Like you don't, you can make a living with a thousand true fans. That's the idea. I, I forgot where it comes from, mm -hmm. but um, that's always been true for me. I've grown very slowly over the years or at least it feels that way and the the base that keeps me alive is um just very invested I guess and mm -hmm. I connect with them on a deeper level uh I mean I make the effort to do that but like it doesn't have to be a 500,000 million huge amount of following on all the different platforms maybe one could get you more views mm -hmm. cool but like yeah it's it's also the the how you interact with them and it's really hard to interact with people if it's if there's a lot if there's a lot of comments and i get that mm -hmm. for sure but yeah just do your best you're human <laughs> you can only do so right. much and, it, it, and if you get like 100 people liking a video i mean think of that think of a room with 100 people in it and they're for cheering for you i mean yeah it doesn't seem it's... like a lot when you're seeing the number on a screen but that's a lot of people that are like rooting so for true. you and that's so, you, you know yeah. i know yeah, do you, and, and I I don't know if you ever get negative comments because you're so nice. I can't imagine anyone leaving yeah, a negative sure. comment. But oh yeah, <laughs> no, it do makes you, me when laugh you get that I'm negative like, comment, is that like <laughs> does it like I'm overshadow like, every positive comment? It, yes, it, and I've gotten way better over the years. But like you know, you'll get a hundred awesome comments and then one negative comment, and that's the one you think about. And I, so yeah. I try to remember how illogical that is and so my husband's mm -hmm. amazing at it he's like do you want me to respond because he'll like totally egg him on and I'm like no I don't want that to be in my comments <laughs> um but he's good he's like always reminding me like you just had a hundred really good comments read those again mm -hmm. and again and that's you know, okay yeah I get it <laughs> but it's so yeah, funny I'm like, like you're watching away. you're watching a yeah. free art video online like <sighs> what just leave if you don't like I know. it I know yeah <laughs> so I know funny. it's it's rough but, it's like, I'll, I'll give you a topic. refund. How about that? You know, I just want to say that when somebody's <laughs> complaining, I'm like, you want your money back? I mean, it was free. That's... It's on YouTube. Yeah. Oh, gosh. I don't get that mentality, but it's it's no matter yeah. where you go online, it's probably going to happen. So just if yeah. you can ignore it, just ignore it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes they're just so wackadoodle that it's like, it's not even like insulting because it's like, oh, wow, I, that was, that's a, I never would have thought of that insult. That is new. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well done on uh, being original troll. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I just, and when I see that a lot of artists I admire and I follow, they sometimes have negative comments and I'm just like, how can you possibly post a negative comment on this person? Is it their, their art is amazing. They're amazing. What? And so you see that happen. You're like, oh, it, it isn't personal because it's happening to even the best people. And it's like, there's just no off button for that side of the war, mm -hmm. the that those types of people. Um, but I always want to click on their their channel. I click on their whenever I see that. I click on oh. their icon to see what they're posting. They're never <laughs> posting anything because anybody that's ever done this has put like content Anon out, the world, put videos yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, you know how hard it is. You're not going to put it out there. You're not going to like, you know. Yeah. Uh, post something like that because you know how hard it is. Anybody that's walked your path knows how hard it is. So they're not going to judge you. The people that are judging you are people that have never done it, never tried yeah. it. Um, the way I they see it, it's they like you're driving on a highway and someone speeds by you and just like flips you off. And you're like, what? Why? And then they just keep yeah. going and you never see them again. Like it's it has nothing to do with you with your life you know you just just keep yep. driving just stay in your lane yeah keep going <laughs> they're having a bad day <laughs> yeah that's it so i i get that but um i don't know if going back to like youtube has totally changed the game for me like uh helped me connect to my audience in a deeper way so i I think that's why I put so much effort here rather than elsewhere. Like on Instagram, it has changed so much. I can't even keep up. I try to post regularly, mm -hmm. but I don't, e I don't even look at the analytics anymore because I'm, <laughs> I don't even mm -hmm. want to know what's happening there. But 
the people who do interact on Instagram are still they seem genuine and like I do enjoy mm-hmm. connecting with people. So I don't completely ignore it, but I just try not to put so much emphasis on it because I don't know what's happening over there. Like, is it going to disappear in a year? And after I spent all that oh, effort, yeah. I don't know. So I don't know. I, I just, in, I would say as um just like as a, a person who uses social media as mm. just like for fun or to scroll or yeah. whatever, I enjoy Instagram because I like how visual it is. I like that because of the type of accounts that I follow, there's no drama. Um, I'm just there to see pretty artwork. So I like inter. I like I like using it as a user yeah. as long as it's you know I'm seeing the people I actually follow, which is the big problem with Instagram. Right. I don't necessarily see. You have to remember who to I'm click following. the following thing, otherwise you yeah. see everything else. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I do like that, and I'm kind of um, and I don't have a lot of growth there. I've been on there for quite a long time, and um, I mean I. Compared to a lot of artists, I don't have a lot of followers, but I mean, there's 20,000 people that said, yeah, I'll I'll look at what mm-hmm. she's doing. So I'm like, hey, that's great. There's 20,000 people here that, you know, maybe 2,000 of them will see a particular post, but I don't use Instagram as far as like brand building or anything. Yeah. I enjoy posting my artwork there. I kind of use it as a a portfolio, I guess I could say, go to, yeah. you know, tag me on Instagram or, and I, and I love doing the art challenges because yeah. like, I don't know. I like Inktober. I like World Watercolor Month. I like the Food Paint Challenge and these mm-hmm. different. I think it's really fun that somebody's like, "Hey, I like to paint buildings. Do you like to paint buildings? Here's a picture of a building. Paint this building with it." You know, I just. <laughs> yeah. I think it's just. I love the community of it. But it, as yeah. far as it like it being brand shareable. building, yeah, yeah. It, it, I like the stories because it's like a little snippet of someone's day. I, I mm-hmm. tend to use it more to like share that side of life, that's mm-hmm. a little behind the scenes and sketches and things like that. Um, but so I I could I agree it's more social it is social media obviously mm-hmm. <laughs> to me it's not as much business as it is social um, but I just mm-hmm. every time I feel like every time every other week I log in it's like something has changed what is going on <laughs> or yeah, lately I, especially I don't try to... so many ads that I just yeah. get exhausted. <laughs> And, oh yeah, yeah. I don't like the reels. I wish I could. I wish there was an option to turn off reels oh, because I, I I love to look at the sing. The, I love the still photos. I want to zoom in. I want to see that little, yeah. you know, that brush stroke. I want to see that detail. If it's mm-hmm. like a, I follow a lot of um, art journalers too, it's like I want to. I want to zoom in. I want to see that little embellishment or um, that yeah. little pattern that you made with a pen in the corner i just love those delicious little details and i don't having a camera move around if i want to watch a video i watch a video on youtube if i want to i want to see a still photo i want to be able to just take my time like i would with a magazine and just appreciate this artwork that's in front of me that someone took the time to make and then upload Um, but i don't look at i don't use instagram as like some powerful business tool just because i've never i never (laughs) got it i guess i've yeah. never been good at instagram um it's been definitely the slow and steady type mm-hmm. thing but i love the community that's over there and yeah. i think it's just such a nice way to look at other people's work too yeah, it is. but yeah it definitely has a lot of a lot of negatives and threads i do not like threads i feel like oh, that's I twitter know but that i know it exists i don't know it's a whole different There's app some... now, so i don't know <sighs> it's weird it's so weird it's kind of like um I just, I kind of grabbed my account just because I had Instagram. So I'm like, well, I'll just make sure I can keep my name over there. But, and then you'll see little advertisements for, not an advertisement, but I guess it's like, like a little carousel of like the first sentence of people's posts. And of course it's the most like incendiary posts. It's the ones that are trying to catch people's (laughs) passion and and attention and stuff. And it just seems to be a lot of people over there, like Twitter, they're just yelling into the void or trying to get Mm. people riled up. And I don't like that. Just people trying to get other people riled up just for the sake of attention and views. And um, that's what I see over there. That's what I saw on Twitter. I never, I never felt comfortable on Twitter or on I know. on threads now it's just uh, it seems like, like it's a race to the bottom ago, yeah years ago I thought Twitter was useful um and kind of cool but then it did just feel very toxic after some point I just stopped using it and I think my blog auto posted there for a while but then the dis- it disconnected Mine too. <laughs> and I was like oh I should probably reset that up but now I don't even want to do that I don't know yeah so I'd say just pick one or two things in apps I guess that you enjoy using and focus on those and try to take the pressure off of making every post perfect and see mm-hmm. it more as like a snippet of your life. Um, I think people just like seeing what other people's lives are like, especially artists and creative people. 
Uh, I know I do. <laughs> so uh, I do too. I do. That's a great thing yeah. about art is that there's there's somebody making it. There's it's not like the, the big debate about artificial intelligence art and whatnot. But like I I love seeing the messy supplies on the desk in the background. I love seeing the you know yeah. the art in progress. Or um, well, I mean that's a nice thing about reels. I guess you're actually seeing like an artist put down some brush strokes, which can be very informative mm -hmm. uh, to see how somebody else is doing it. And um, but yeah, that that's never going to be well, I'll say never, but I don't think that'll ever be captured by AI. <laughs> seeing that mess in the background, seeing the the brush stroke from right. the hand, all, all that that those elements make us human. I think that's going to be much more valuable too going forward as we try yeah. to pick out: is that real art? Was that made? Was that AI know. art? You know, it as the lines get blurred, it, yeah, it reaffirmed my excitement, I guess, about YouTube because yeah, someone could easily copy my art with AI or however, but. Like, would you watch a purely AI made video of someone walking around outside of the painting? Like, uh, you know, I like mm. to, if I share the experience of doing the thing, that's the value. That's where the value comes from, not the fin finished piece or the final thing. So it just was like, OK, cool. Like, if I keep doing my thing that I enjoy doing, I'm not super worried about, you know, getting my whole identity stolen by AI. <laughs> uh, I yeah. know there's some apps out there like web glaze and stuff that you can use to you input, you upload your art to it and then it like spits it out in a way AI can't read. Um, if you're yeah. interested, you could go check that out, but it's uh, there's little things like that starting to help, but I don't know. I just, I, I'm sure yeah, I'm not it's... even, I, I'm not <laughs> aware of all of the different ways AI is working out there. So I'm st again, I'm staying in my lane. I enjoy making videos about the process, so I'm going to keep doing that. Mm -hmm. And like yeah, you said, think, sharing the, um, the desk, the messy desk. I love a messy yeah. desk. <laughs> yes. There was this, um, and it's still going, it's called What is your, What's on Your Work Day's what's on your work desk Wednesday, which was like a challenge uh -huh. blog and people just post. Yeah, it's still going. Um, oh, I love and it. you can just go and see this huge, everyone can just like, if you want to take a picture of your desk on a Wednesday, then you post it on your blog and you leave a link That's on this cute. website. Like and that. then there's this huge <laughs> line of this huge list of people sharing their workspaces. And it's, it's so fun to see. I'm just, I'm just nosy. I'm like, what do you got over there? Ooh, yeah. What's that? I want to see. Oh, I have that. I want to try that. <laughs> you know, yeah. I find, I find looking at what other people are using if something i own too i might have forgotten about it and i'm like oh that's really cool that's inspiring i gotta get that up and play with it so yeah, yeah it's it's fun it's a little peek behind this behind the curtains a bit and yeah. um it's nice to see. I don't think art teachers are going to have um, as much of a of a problem with AI because people are always going to want to learn, learn and they're not going to want to learn from a computer. They're going to want to learn from a real person. And it may mean that maybe the online tutorials aren't doing, you know, aren't as popular and people want to get like, I, I think people ebb and flow. And if everything you're getting is AI and online, I think you're going to be like, hey, I need to see a person. I need to go to a class. I need to sit around a table with other people. I need to go yeah. on a workshop or something like that that will you know make them more connected we'll because alive. i don't feel connection <laughs> what's that yeah just make them feel yeah. alive you know like yeah i get that i'm definitely an introvert and i a homebody so you know i have limited uh interaction with people in the real world but i still need it like i i do crave it and mm -hmm. especially in an art setting it is so wonderful and so fulfilling to connect with people in that way and, you know, I'll just take as much time as I need to recover after. That's fine. <laughs> um, but the more I was finding myself not doing that, I was like, I actually need this. I, I know I'm an introvert, but I need this. And I was like, it's okay to need it. And yeah, I don't think everyone needs it as much as others, but it's if you can find like a community of some kind in, the, in person, it, it will make a big impact on your life. Even if it's just a meetup, like I have a, a local art meetup once a month, not so much now in the coldest part of the year, but like in the summer, especially most of the year, we meet up once a month and it's so nice. Yeah, I joined the um, the Plain Air Painters of Maine group on Facebook and every whenever anyone's going painting, they just post it. The only rule is it has to be free and there has to mm. be um, restrooms available like nearby mm. and they can list idea. if there's, yeah, so they can list if yeah. there's like handicap accessibility, what it's like, and you know that at least one other person's going to be there, which is yeah. handy. And um, I met some nice ladies doing that and 
it's I, I bet there's more of those little groups that you might not be aware of on this mm -hmm. was on Facebook. Um, so you search plein air painters in your state, you may find yep. that there's something there that you can or join in on. And because like I yeah. ours ours varies between like going to somewhere remote and going somewhere more with buildings. So like you there's all different terms you could try searching for in your area and even our area, I mean, our area is within, you know, two hour driving distance. So it's mm -hmm. not j the just immediate this town. Um, so if you are somewhere remote, it might exist. You might just have to make a little bit more effort, but it is always mm -hmm. worth it. It's always worth it for me anyway. <laughs> Yeah. And there's, and, and if you can't get out, um, there are also groups online that you can find mm -hmm. that will do something yeah. like, like we're doing here. It would be like a, like a zoom group. It wouldn't be broadcast on the like internet for the public, but you would have like a private zoom group or a Facebook group or something. Mm -hmm. And you'd have, you'd be hanging out with people and yeah. you could share what you're working on or just, just to draw together. And yeah, <clears throat> there's lots of, lots of little groups like that too. So look around and find your, find your tribe and, yeah. you know, make connections and make art. Yes. It's a good, well, I think that's a good way to uh, good to wrap point. this, uh, <laughs> this up. Uh, do you have anything you'd like to add before we go? Oh, I, don't, I think we've covered a lot of topics and I really I so appreciate too. this. It's been fun and it was really fun to talk, talking to you and hopefully I didn't ramble too much. <laughs> Not at all. Look, you're talking to the the talking queen. I look forward so. to your sat chat tomorrow. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I got to go film that after this. So hopefully oh. the headphones haven't matted down my hair too much. <laughs> but, You'll be sitting uh, there like fluffing you. it and flipping it. I'll be fluffing. I'll be fluffing. People will be, in, will be annoyed. Like, stop flipping your hair. <laughs> Why do they get annoyed so come about on. that? <laughs> oh, yeah. They get annoyed about that. Oh. There's always something. There's always something. Um, Just do it I, extra, I will put links to extra sass. <laughs> extra flair. Yeah. Flipping the hair with extra flair today. Um, well, I uh, I will leave links to your YouTube channel, your blog, your website, your Patreon, oh, anywhere else <laughs> folks can find you. Um, and, yeah, definitely give Sarah a follow because she – creates the most beautiful her not only is her artwork a second to none but her cinematography and her videos are like what what all the rest of us um muggles on youtube making videos <laughs> aspire to it's just so beautiful and uh it oh, kind of we all make a little magic in our own ways <laughs> you make magic it's, in it's your like own going way on. too <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I love it because it's like I'm taking a little mini vacation to Scotland and I don't have to pay for an airline uh, airline yeah, ticket. So <laughs> there we go. Uh if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. I do appreciate it. Tell your friends. And until next time, happy crafting. Bye. Bye everyone. <laughs>